So um, now we want to touch on a subject that you actually have a great video on it for all listening right now. Um, the rabbi has a video on YouTube about prayer, the purpose of prayer. Um, but we want to expand on that a little bit. Um, you mentioned that we can't change God's mind. Obviously, um, if anyone who follows the Maimonidean tradition understands that. Um, and can you also touch on like superstitious elements that some Jews use to kind of close the gap? between us and God. Um, some people use like mystical formulations and incantations, pray 40 days at the Kotel. Um, all these things are kind of, seem kind of counterproductive um, to the message. So can you just expand on that? Well, well again, I, I, I have to repeat always that, that I, I do not want to denigrate and take anything away from people that is precious to them. Uh, as I say, um, you know, somebody wants to ask the Svat Emes, one of the great Chassidish Rebbe's of Ger, he says, uh, what's the best segula, right? Segula are these shortcuts, these uh, amulets, these talismans. So he said, the best segula is the yisam li segula mikol hamin, that you should live a life that's like a precious treasure to God. Meaning to say, you don't look for shortcuts. We, 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 we live in a world sometimes, uh, which is almost Madison Avenue-like, in which we look for gimmicks, we look for shortcuts, we look for talismans. We look for magic. We look for superstition. Uh, we look for various artificial ways of, of, of connecting to God somehow by short-circuiting the process of Torah and mitzvot, of Odah, working on ourselves. Because it's much easier to get holy water that somebody blessed than it is to study Torah or, or, or the like. So... I think it's important that uh, we not really overemphasize the role of these magical elements within Judaism. And we focus on the core. And the core is mitzvot, Torah, tikkun hamidot, avat Yisrael, avat Hashem. And that is really how we get what we need in the world. That brings down the shefa of bracha in the world, because that is God's will, that we live certain types of lives. So in some ways, I, I think there are good school out and there may be destructive. I mean, let, let's take, you gave an example of going to the Koto for 40 days. Now you can look at that and say, that's another magical shit, and, you know, we shouldn't give that credence. On the other hand, you know, if, if going to the Kotel gives a person kavana, if it inspires them. So you could say it is a means hmm. towards putting a person in a certain inspirational state. So it's not a magic thing. It's, it's a it's a it's a hachana for tefillah with kavana. So I could see I could see that as a, a maybe a legitimate exercise to get a person into a certain frame of mind. I think even within uh, the rationalistic framework uh, that you're favoring, I could understand this. And by the way, there's an interesting. Uh, you know, the Ram the Rambam himself was in Eretz Israel as a as an adolescent. His family briefly lived in Eretz Israel and. He was able to see the fragment of the koto, which was much smaller then because it was all covered up. And he writes that that was such a joy in his heart to be in the proximity of the Beit HaMikdash that he celebrated that day as a Yom Tov, a private Yom Tov in his family for the rest of his life. So the Rambam was also aroused by that experience. On the other hand, when you're talking about uh, magic amulets and water, and this, and that, and strings that uh, walked, uh, were taken around Kevra Rucho, I think at best, those are kind of useless. Uh, okay, but even if it's useless, that wouldn't go to matter. All right, so, you know, in lo yoel, lo yazik. But I think what's worse is it distracts people. It takes people away uh, from their true focus. And then they become a little bit destructive. Uh, so I think some school outs that are conducive to leading you on the path of the car are valid in that way. Others might be counterproductive. So, want yeah, so I totally, I totally agree with your sentiments. I think the problem is, is that the way it's formulated yes. doesn't lend itself to that understanding. For instance, um, let, let me, let's just, well, the 40 days in the Kotel, it's formulated as go 40, 40 days to the Kotel and you'll see a Shavuot instead of go 40 days in the Kotel for, to find, you know, to, 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 to have a better Kesher to, to the Borei Olam or whatever. Right. Yeah. Or even in a situation like uh, Kivrit Sadikim, 
you see like there's the Medrash with Kalev. He went to gain and gain uh, to fortify himself by going to his, to the Marata Machpela before he went into Eretz Israel so that he, you know, remembers, you know, the, his mission and, you know, you know, have his ancestors to, to, to be by his ancestors in their grave, you know, gives him a certain uh, strength, let's call it, to be able to go on the mission and not fall. That's beautiful, but but the way Kivrit Sadiqim are formulated today becomes a, you know, if you want to see Yeshua, go to the this cover, that cover. Yeah. So I agree so much with your sentiments. I just wish that it would be formulated formulated that way more. Well, again, I I, I mean I agree with you. I think I think we're on the same page here. I mean, unfortunately, uh, you know, there's a certain staka in Eretz Israel here. I'll mention it because everybody knows it. Kupato ear, which is just uh, you know. Page after page after page are these magical claims, you know, do this, do this for $150, you know, you will have a katan for your daughter and for $200, you know, you'll have a child. And, and they make these, these promises and, and they invent, they even invent some school out that nobody even heard before. Uh, you know, new, new kvarim are discovered, <laughs> new kvarim are discovered every day, like, you know, I mean, you know, you know the kever of some biblical personality that no one ever was aware of, you know, <laughs> and uh, it becomes a marketing gimmick, frankly, and, you know, and gimmicks are superficial by definition. Uh, they're misleading, but what bothers me most is that they are distracting. Uh, they, they take away the focus on what is fundamental, it becomes and, then, and then they become destructive in that way. Right, right. Okay. And it's not even that it's distracting, but it's, it's also, it's, it can turn people off, because if they're, Putting all their eggs in one basket, and then they discover, you know, that this is a, sh- a scam, or this yeah. didn't work for them. Then, then, then they throw. You know, it's kind of like you remember when uh, years ago the key of organizations would promote like Bible codes, and then if you put all your eggs in that basket, and then someone comes and debunks it, then you're like, oh, the whole Torah is nonsense. You know that that's the uh, danger yes, yes. of of that's putting correct. into that's belief. Correct. This is yeah. actually what, the source of like idolatrous thinking. Because it comes from the same place. It's 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 not based in um, reality, you know. So that's really um, the the issue that that we have. But I want to also because we this part of this question was so that our audience can hear from your perspective or how you explained it on on the other video. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. How, itself, what, yes. How why do we pray if we can't change God's mind? That's that's really what we wanted you to explain. Yeah. Well, again, I, I don't remember exactly what I said then, but. Uh, Generally What's the speaking, idea of prayer, yes. right? What's the idea? Yes. The, the well-known theme, which is both in Maimonides and in Joseph Albo and, and many, many, many thinkers, is that because God is perfect and God is what's called a simple unity, by definition, God cannot change. Uh, changeability would be connected with uh, multiplicity and a simple unity remains constant. So this was the famous question, uh, how can prayer work at all? Uh, because if God's will is you get a certain thing, then you'll get it. And if it's not his will, you won't get it. There's nothing you can say that makes a difference, that should make a difference. It's not like, you know, like me with Chaim Walder, where I changed my mind because I, I didn't have full information. No, that's not going to be God's, God's situation. But here's the point. The point basically is that prayer is about changing yourself. Now, God, when you're in an X position, so God interacts with you in a certain way. If you're in X squared position, you're a different type of person, then God will deal with you in a different way, not because God changed his mind, but because you're no longer in the situation that you were. Uh, you are in a different level of spirituality, a different level of perception, a different level of understanding. And if that's the case, God's connection to you is going to be different. Like the Rambam writes, for example, in many places, Hashgacha Pratit. Uh, is a function of your spiritual level. So uh, the, the greater your spiritual level, the greater the hashgacha of God will be in your life. The less your spiritual level, the more you are left to the mikrei ha-teva, uh, natural uh, world, whatever it would be. So as a result, uh, the ultimate efficacy of prayer is based on, on self-transformation. And that self-transformation occurred, in fact, even grammatically, the hits palel. Now, palel, pay lamed lamed, uh, does not mean pray. It's a shoris that means to judge. Holy hmm. limb. Le hits palel is to engage in a process of self judgment 
self-introspection, meaning I become transformed by recognizing my dependence on God. I become inculcated with humility, with submission, with a deeper understanding of the purpose of my life and my priorities in life. At that point, God looks at me and says, oh, well, you're a different person. My interaction with you will be different based on the person you have hopefully become as a result of, of, of your prayer. So that, that, that's one, I, I think that's one idea, that prayer works by virtue of its uh, self-transformation. And that comes from Lehitz Palel. I think there's another perspective, which is a, li a little bit more mystical, but I think it's a very, very meaningful one. And it fits a rational viewpoint as well. And uh, that is that the purpose of prayer is not necessarily to change God at all. The purpose of prayer is to establish an interaction with God in which I'm connected to Hashem. I feel his presence. Maybe his answer to me will be no. And that's realistic, meaning I have no guarantees. He's going to answer my prayer in the way that I want. But as the Panavich Rav used to say, no is also an answer. God is listening. I'm interacting with him. And my prayers can be answered in ways that I didn't necessarily anticipate. For example, if I'm praying to be extricated from a difficult situation and that prayer is not answered, but, but it was my prayer that gave me the strength, that gave me the resilience, that gave me the ability to put one foot in front of another foot. That's answering my prayer as well. He gave me the strength to move forward from the tragedy that I encountered. Now, if God gave us the Holocaust, so to speak, and that, that's another question, did God give it to us as a human choice? God also gave us the state of Israel, meaning God gave us ways to grow and to respond from the adversities and challenges of life. So it may not be what I asked for, but he answered my prayer in a myriad of ways. So th those are kind of uh, the, the some of the ideas of, of, of prayer. It's certainly not about buttering God up or flattering him or giving him information that he was not aware of. That certainly is not the way it works, but it works by self-transformation and works by establishing uh, the intimacy of a relationship. So how would you square that with like the, the parts of prayer? Obviously, it's not a major part of prayer, but the parts of prayer that involve us requesting from God. Specifically, yeah. your first point then. Yes. Your second point, maybe it's not so relevant, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it is a good point. And, and by the way, I, I wouldn't be to, be to strengthen your question, I wouldn't call it a minor part of the prayer. I mean, most of the, you know, at least a third of the Amidah is direct requests give us this, give us this, give us yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So one cannot deny that petition request is part of prayer. But one way of looking at it, again, this may not fit the words as, as nicely as I would like, is that when I ask God heal me, I'm really dialoguing with myself. I know that you, Hashem, are the source of it. Mm -hmm. And the more I internalize that, the more I change my spiritual relationship with God. And then I become deserving of the favor that I'm seeking him to bestow. Mm -hmm. So in a sense... You're asking God, but as a means of internalizing what you are trying to believe with the panimiyot of your of your neshama. Right. So it's it's in a sense, it's like you're expanding your consciousness in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I like know. it's like it's like a meditation in which you right. repeat this mantra over and over again until you really, really feel it inside of you. Right. When, when you're asking Hashem, you are you are by default also therefore bringing the the concept of Hashem more into you so right, it, it's, right, it's, right. it's automatically doing something yeah yeah so you're 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 being uplifted right now again uh, this is the ideal I mean I, I have I, I'll be the first to confess in, in, in my tefillot and really all of our tefillot probably we're not always reaching those sublime uh, levels but at its best this is what a tefillah experience is, is supposed to be I also think maybe a different way of looking at it, and I'm just kind of just thinking about it on my own. It doesn't mean anything, but, you know, like you'll see like in the Torah, like as much as we try to de-anthropomorph, try to try to remove God, right, from from attributes or, you know, uh, corporeality, the Torah does speak in that 
in that way, right? So um, meaning that not everything that is necessarily, not everything that we, we engage in within the text is necessarily talking to us from the highest ideal, right? Meaning the, the Torah, even though the highest ideal is to be able to remove God from attributes, remove God from corporate reality and all that stuff, it's still, it's talking to, it's talking within a level of an audience, right? That we have to kind of outgrow, right? So perhaps tefillah would work, the, the request in tefillah would work similar to that, mm -hmm. to the way the Torah speaks, right? So yeah. yes, mm -hmm. you're asking Hashem might not be the most, I, asking God in a, in that simple way might not be the ideal, but it's a place to start where eventually a person will outgrow and understand the higher um, ideal of what that's trying to do. I, I think that's a, I think that is a legitimate point because uh, people, when we are at lower levels of spirituality, we need certain motivators. Exactly. That might not be ultimate truths, but they get us, they get the job done. Exactly. Like Maimonides, uh, the Rambam actually writes uh, that this is one of the reasons why the Torah de-emphasizes Olam Haba and all of the reward for the mitzvot is always this world. And even though the ultimate reward is Olam Haba, but the idea is that you know, Olam Haba is not going to motivate me, motivate me necessarily. I need a here and now. I need to know right. I'm going to have a better, better bank account or, or the kids will be healthy. And therefore, these are kind of motivators at lower levels that get us into the ring, so to speak. And yeah, that is better than me. Achieve, yeah, that's what I meant. Higher spiritual levels. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um,